when the computer revolution started to occur, yeah, something in me just lit up and I'm, I'm like, I don't care if I suck at this. Like, it just turns me on so much that I could put this into this machine and it gives me something that's amazing. You guys, please help me welcome Danny Yount. Welcome to the show, and thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Sure. You and I had traded emails, phone calls, and there was a moment when Danny wasn't going to do this. So I think it's awesome that he's doing this, and I want to thank you guys for being out here, to trek out here, and to support what it is that we're doing, and you are a vital part to our success. So Danny, I think every hero has an origin story, and I want to learn about yours, and I want to spend a lot of time in your origin story. So yeah. first off, Tell me about young Danny. What did you do? Where did you grow up? <laughs> Tell me a little bit about that. Well, um, how young? Uh, maybe like uh, you know, the formative years. The formative, well, um, I grew up in the Bay Area. I was just a regular kid. with. We had just a regular family. We were in, from a very blue collar neighborhood. Uh, my mom was a waitress, my dad, uh, he was a, a really fantastic artist. Maybe it was because of the period that, he grew up in Kansas, they all did. I don't think there was a thriving graphic design industry in Kansas, but I could be wrong. Um, nonetheless, after he had left the Navy, he um, be became more interested in structural engineering and things like that, and he did work on the San Francisco airport and uh, um, East Bay Mud, which is a, a sewage place. But um, I was um, kind of under the understanding growing up that your job is basically kind of supposed to suck. And, you know, you just put in your time and you work hard and you go home and that's when the fun stuff begins. Right. But um, having tried that so many times, I just, I, I couldn't get myself to be vested enough to really want that for myself. And I was petrified of pursuing art because everyone told me you'll never make any money at this. Like there's no, you know, but I had a very, um, I hope I can continue in this. I had a very painful experience when I was um, uh, uh, 11. Um, I can't do it. Can't you can do, do it, it, Danny, you can do it. You guys, if you guys can sense it, we're going deep right away. It's like one minute into it, we're going to go deep. I've asked Danny to share as much as he's comfortable with, so we're just going to give him space. When I was 11, I, um, I shouldn't be doing this. When I was 11, uh, I woke up early in the morning, and I went to the garage, and my dad was uh, packing up his truck. And um, if, I, if I saw what was coming, it would have made a lot of sense. But we were like a family one day, and then all of a sudden, everything's different. And I'm like, Dad, where are you going? And he said, he said something like, I don't know, um, I'll be back, um, we'll talk. I, it, was, it was like, I'll be away. He left, he just left. And um, he left right before my brother and I were entering into those very formative years. It's almost like he ran away from it. So, like a lot of kids during that time, and this was, by then we're getting near the 80s, kind of. I was a teenager in the 80s. It, you just, you do everything you can to fill that void. Are you the big brother? Yeah. Okay, how, how young, how much, what's the age difference between you and your brother? Two years. I did all the things that 
a young man should not do. I did a lot of drugs and alcohol and, um, you know, everything I could find that validated my existence somehow, but also buried the, all this pain. And um, so a fantastic thing happened to me when I was 19. But um, we'll kind of, um, and it changed everything. I finally, I got right back on track. I met my wife. Um, life was fantastic. At 19? At 19. Wow. And uh, we started a family. But during those years, you know, being, the, being taught you got to work hard, you got to get in there. My mom uh, set me up in my first job. I was 16, and I worked at a gas station, you know. And the boss was wonderful because, you know, a friend of the family like that, this curmudgeon man, saw this kid with, you know, no fatherly figure, and he kind of took me under his wing and was very much that way. And I loved working at that crappy garage where we had no AC and it was just burning heat. And I was like one really, it, it, I was just dealing, I was a, a grease monkey in a garage. And I did that for a summer and then I did all these other jobs. But one reason why I had 35 jobs is because, you know, I would do all that stuff. I, I would do a job, I would hate it. I would do something dumb and get fired. I would go to the next job. You know, it was, it was just a cycle that just went on until I was 19. But I worked hard. I still worked hard. And I, and, but it wasn't until I got my life together that I really made a concentrated effort to get somewhere. And I tried everything. And um, I tried everything from construction to driving auto parts, making pizzas, driving pizzas working in anything and everything I can just to find that one thing other than art, you know, that, that would um, make, that would be my thing. Did you feel pressured to fill the gap of what your father was doing and providing money for the family? Yeah, I, I think so. Well, because I, in my generation, you're taught when you're 18, you're out of here. Like, right. you get your stuff together here it comes. When you're 18, you got to go. And um, to a kid with no direction, that is petrifying. I mean, I remember thinking, I'm going to be 20. Life's over. Like, just stupid stuff like that. You know, you have these ridiculous benchmarks that are put in front of you. At least your thinking is that way. And uh, you react very strongly toward these things that are coming up. So. Um, but that aside, when finally I kind of got it together mentally, um, I said, okay, what am I doing? Like, I hate all of this stuff. I would, I would go to work and watch the clock. And I'm sure a lot of people here can relate to that. You're just like, okay, four more hours, man. I'm out of here. We, there was one job I had when we were actually, we had this little huddle like three more hours you know everyone's like saying it the same way and um i had one job there was like a big bell that rang for lunch and a bell that rang when everyone got off it was that kind of smokestackish kind of thing and it just felt so meaningless you know there's no passion in any of this stuff so i said okay so what i'm not going to make any money at art but i know how to do this like i always drew and i was um the kind of artist, at least to my teachers, like I, got, I would get pulled out of school and they would take me to an art event while all the other kids are, you know, studying. They, they saw a lot of promise in this kid that really knew how to draw really well. But I didn't know what graphic design was until um, I, just, I just started, I can't remember when I figured out what graphic design was. But, um, Somewhere around, when I was, when I was um, around 21, 22, we were going to Seattle one time, and I just, I just had this idea. I thought it would be really awesome to be a designer and working down there at Pioneer Square. I love Seattle. I don't know if anyone's been there. I'm sure people in this room have been to Seattle. But it just seemed like a really cool place and a really cool thing to do. And I thought, how can I figure that out? Now, are you moving out of the Bay Area into Seattle? Yeah I, was, yeah, I was in the Bay Area, but the Bay Area was really 
cool during that time, it still is, but during the time that I was growing up, Apple Computer just came out. And everyone's talking about this amazing little machine that, it, it, I mean, it wasn't so amazing by today's standards, but you guys have to understand when that hit, like, there was a lot of energy and excitement, way more than the latest Google Pixel or, you know, some VR thing or anything. It was like, this is going to change the world. And I remember going to uh, junior high, and I used to stop at this computer shop where they had the, the Lisa, I think. And I used to play, they had a couple of video games that you could do on it, but I thought it was like the coolest thing in the world. And that interest, the technical aspects of it, really got me turned on. Like, I didn't even care if I couldn't figure out you know, the more refined um, ideas of design. I just love this computer thing. Like, this is really cool. Maybe this is my way in. So my mom took out a loan and co-signed it with my name on it, I guess. And uh, we got a, my first Mac. I was uh, 22. Um, when, and it was a Mac, it was a Mac 2 Si. It was the first color Mac. And that was just fascinating to me. And I, and I, would, I, would, to, I would just yell at it and scream at it to try to figure out how to m work this thing. And I read, I didn't just sort of read the parts in the manual that I needed to know. I read the whole thing. You're like, one of those guys. All the way through. Because, I mean, there's all these hidden things in there that you don't, you don't, no one cares about like hot keys and stuff like that. And, and so I, I made it a goal to get as proficient as I possibly can on this thing, even though I didn't know anything about design. I just felt like, and there, that was the feeling too then was, it was like, if you got this thing that's so revolutionary, it will help you learn like anything, you know? Because um, I don't know if anyone in this room remembers design prior to that. But I would cut Rubylith. Does anyone in this room know what Rubylith is? Dude, you would, you, everything was hand drawn. Everything had to be cut by an exacto blade to make a plate to do things. And when the Mac came out, it's like, oh, Bezier's. Wow, this is amazing. Wow, I could print this thing. Oh my gosh, this is unbelievable. And and you know, all of the industry guys were like, oh, that will never, you know, they're like, just like, yeah, just like <laughs> film and digital, right? Like all the filmmakers are like, ah, digital, pff, you know. It really did change everything. But, and then there was this community that started forming and all of these, there was this program called HyperCard. Do you remember HyperCard? And all it was was the Mac would just generate a series of cards that created an animation. It was like a digital flip book. But that was the first foray into multimedia. And so here I was just so excited. Like I was swimming in, all of these, this capability all of a sudden. So I started messing around with, with HyperCard and then Macromedia Director came out and it was basically HyperCard on steroids with color. And, and I was doing animations and learning animations. And so anyways, one main, main reason I, I really took to that was because I knew my disadvantage clearly. There's no way I'm, I'm gonna stand up against a student from you know, like a, a P. Scott McKellar or someone who just has this killer portfolio. And, and, they, and back then they used to make these ridiculous packages like saw blades and stuff like that. It was all about this amazing thing that you would send to a design company and get in. And I thought, how can I get through that? And nobody was doing digital portfolios. So I, I said to myself, well, obviously this is a way in. So. I started learning Macromedia Director. I, I even learned uh, their coding language, Lingo, I think it was. And um, I made a reel out of the worst design you could possibly imagine. But it got the attention of a studio owner, and that's where I got my first job. Okay, before we go there, I don't want to talk about the first job just yet. I'm having a hard time mapping the timeline of how old you are, the odd and end jobs that you were doing, and I have to imagine you tinkering at home with your box. Like, how old are you? What, what time are we talking about here? 24, actually. I just, I just uh, got married. I think, no, I was 22. 
when did I get married? I think I got married in 22. We can fact check that later. Backing up just a little bit, I started working actually when I was 12. I, had a, I was a paper boy. That was my first job. So I, I definitely started learning. Uh, I started developing a work ethic. And that is quite a thing to learn as a kid. Because you get that stack of Sunday papers dropped on your, your doorstep, and you have to get up at 5 in the morning to do that stuff, and you're 12. It's like, that's a lot of work. But, and then you have to collect the money. And that gets really crazy. Like a 12-year-old kid knocking on a door to collect money, and the stupid, subversive things that people would do to try to get out of that. You know, even she like the, the, the guy that drove the van wanted to give me like a skateboard necklace instead of pay me. Oh my gosh. And I'm like, this is, forget this. I'm not going to do this anymore. But um, Can I just jump in for a second? Yeah. When I was growing up, I was probably 12, 13, and all I wanted to do was hustle and make money, and you couldn't work until you're like 15 or 16, I can't remember, legally, right? Yeah. Except for to be That's a right. paper boy. You, you had and, to get a work permit. Yeah, you had to get a work permit. And my friend Evan had a paper route, and he was balling with his money. It was amazing. And all I wanted, like I envied Evan. I wanted to be the paper boy, and I couldn't get it because they don't let their routes go. And you, you were my Evan. I was like, I wanted to be you, and you're out there hustling. Okay, so let's keep, keep going. Where should I go? Where do you want to go? Well, with you know what I want to do is you told me something that uh, helped me to understand your work. You've had 35 jobs and you wanted to get into design. But you had said the route of going to an art school was not possible for you. It was too much money. Right. So you did every weird thing you could to get into that right. world, that industry. And you, you went down one route, you went down another, and it was crazy. And then you told me you were working uh, at a, is it a print company and you're plotting graphics? Well, what had happened was my mother-in-law had said, well, here's this job I see in the paper, you know, that, what do you think of this? And it was a sign company in Oakland, California called The Art Sign Company. And I'm like, okay, well, it's not exactly what I want to do, but why not? I'll go interview and they liked me. And in 89, when you made a sign, there was no, graphic. I was on a computer, but the interface was basically something you see in an insurance agency. It's just like a bunch of numbers across in, a, in like a, um, a CAD looking sort of a DOS interface. And so I would have to type in numerically the letting, the size of the type, what typeface I wanted to use. All of that was just data. And then I would hit the button and then it would refresh and there's, you know, there's your piece of garbage until you figure out how it kind of, you know. But the, the beauty of that was that I, it really helped me understand through repetition the critical nature of, you know, distance of letting and, and juxtaposition and all that stuff. It sounds silly, but signage, you know, has real estate signage, which is what we make, has that stuff to a degree. And then it would cut vinyl. Can you guys visualize that? It also teaches you to envision it because at that yeah. point it wasn't like drag it, you know, arrow up, arrow down. It was you have to think about what that's gonna look like. Right. That's right. It yeah, it was it, it took forever. It took way longer than it should have. But back then everyone was cool with forever. I mean we had rotary phones for crying out loud. Like Danny and I are only a few years apart in age. So all the things he's talking about, I know and I've seen. I've cut Ruby list. And I didn't typeset via code on, on a DOS machine, but that's what you did. And when he started talking about typing in code to get graphics, and then you see that work, it's very digital and precise and grids. Doesn't that, like, all of a sudden that crazy stuff that he was doing to try to get into design, all of a sudden it makes sense. His fascination with computers and technology, because that was his way in. Or at least that's how our story is unfolding at this point in time, yeah. right? Okay, well, I went from art sign company to, I, I moved to Washington. Then I had to figure that out. Um, we were literally like living with my wife's parents. We were practically on welfare. A woman felt so sorry for us one time she brought us a bag of groceries. It's like, you want to talk about starving artists? I was there. But I was like, I have to figure this out. And you have a kid at this time. Yeah, we had a, kid, we had a son, and that was a huge, huge motivation. Yeah. So I had to figure this out. But, but anyways, um, I absolutely loved this new computer I had. I, I still kept making these 
reels. A lot of they were just terrible. They they were it was all these interactive pieces that were goofy and silly, and I was trying to figure that out. Well, I finally made one that I called Art Box, and it had this looping animation. Back then, the the style was like um, what Chip, uh, what was his name? Uh, Chuck. Charles Anderson. Yeah, he he had all this clip arty yeah, kind Charles of stuff, yes. and I did this loop. Yeah, with all this. Back then, it was really cool to have this loop of all this clip art stuff. And it played the art of noise. And uh, it was the intro into the thing. And then it went into my really bad work. But the, the, there was a studio owner named John Van Dyke, who was a rock star and report guy in Seattle, working in Seattle. And uh, he was a fantastic designer. Like, a lot of people underestimate um, the level of talent in that kind of a discipline, but it is a discipline still. And uh, he loved, he was, he was a Dutch guy, he loved typography, he had a great taste, and he, he, but he wanted, he saw the end of annual reports. He kind of saw that uh, there was a lot of stuff that was changing in the business that maybe I should be thinking about interactive stuff. And I, it was like a time and place thing, you know, I just showed up and, and he, he liked me, he liked, he liked, I think he liked my enthusiasm more, way more than the portfolio. Like he could see that I was trying really hard and I had something. He did tell me he thought I was a diamond in the rough. That's where my understanding and level of design went from here to here. Like in four years working with that guy, and at times it was very hard. He working was, on annual reports. I helped him with annual reports, but he also wanted to do this thing on the side, you know. He was uh, kind of getting near uh, retirement in, in his company. None of us knew that at the time, but he was just looking for the next thing. And so I would do his fun stuff with him, and, and I, would, through the, I would also work on his annual reports. But uh, we started folding into what I was doing with him. His, he, ba he basically came up with this idea for a CD called 40 Years of Ideas. And it was four years of ad report design that you put on a CD. We made that. It was very successful. It got a bunch of awards. We did a few websites after that and got a, a, a lot of awards for that stuff. And that was kind of the beginning of everything. What year was this? This was... Uh, <laughs> websites, because, you know, the World Wide Web. 91 yeah. was when I, I uh, became... When you were from? Yeah. Two years prior to that, I was freelancing for him. But I officially became a professional designer in 94, right when the internet came out. And yeah. I think sometimes we need somebody to give us a break. Absolutely. And you've been jamming at this, jamming. It's like it's not working, it's not working. Before you met John Van Dyke, did you feel any sense of discouragement? Like maybe this uh, is all a dream? The time. So I, what got you up in the morning to keep There's at nothing it? else I can do. I was you like, could, you could deliver done. papers and you no, could make pizzas. No. Why not? Because I wasn't happy. Like, I, it didn't, well, this life is so short. Like, why do we want to waste it on stuff we hate? That doesn't make any sense. Like, this is about what we're gifted for. And we have to figure that out. What are we, and not what are we, definitely not what we want people to think we're gifted for or trying to, be accepted into certain kinds of things, but definitely what do we do extremely well. How did you know, uh, even as a 24-ish uh, year old man, that this was the right thing? I get asked this all the time. Like, I feel like I wanna give up. Maybe design or being a creative person just isn't in the cards for me. What do you, how do you answer that? Well, th that's a good question because um, I, even today, self-doubt is a huge part of all of this. I mean, wouldn't you agree? You know, um, I don't know how you are, but still to this day when I do a presentation, I'm like, this sucks, they're gonna hate it, I'm not gonna get the job. Y you know, that's what makes us uh, wanna push harder. But you either, you're either gonna push harder or you're gonna just kind of, you know, try to wiggle out of it or or think, well, you know, um, I'll just hedge my bets here. That's not a good, I don't think it's a good way to think when we're doing this stuff, but um, I think it's just determination. You're like, if that guy can figure it out, I could figure it out. You know what I mean? Like, 
maybe it's good to do that, like draw a comparison. Read biographies of fantastic people who became fantastic, like what made them fantastic? I think of like, um, I recently read Elon Musk's biography. Have you read that? His whole story is just perseverance. That's, I mean, of course, he's a brilliant technologist. And I think he's a, like a physicist or something too, but, or a rocket, I mean, he understands all that stuff. He's like a rocket scientist, but, but he, he had so many periods throughout his thing that it was like, it's over, you're done, you're gonna fail, you owe too much money, you're not gonna get out of this, and he just stuck it out. And that, that's what I did, I just, I'm like, there's no, I've got a kid, there's nothing else I like doing. If I'm gonna succeed and make money at anything, it has to be this. Wow. It just has to. Well, I find that to be very common in entrepreneurs, not always in creative people, that you give yourself no option. It's either you die doing this or you succeed. Right. Because you gotta think, guys, I mean, just put this in context. How many times have you been told no? And would you have broken at the fifth no, the tenth no? You gotta think about that a little bit. 35 no's later, this man is on his path. That's remarkable to me. And I'd like to think, like, I'm a pretty determined guy, but at 34, I might have broken. I don't know. Like, you start to, like, you're talking about self-doubt. And we're walking around with that, and it's just like, you know, maybe I can't be an NBA athlete. Maybe I just can't. Maybe it's not in the card for me, and I need to figure out what I'm all about. I mean, I will look at, right in the eye of some young kid who's asking me this question, and I always say right to him, maybe you're not an entrepreneur. Because if you ask me if you are, maybe you're not. And you know what? Just because you decided to, today to be a graphic designer, that doesn't mean you get to be one. But you knew. Well, but I always return to this question. I would rather try it and fail than to not try it and wonder my whole life, like, what if I did that? You, you, that, that would be a, a really horrifyingly nagging question that you would have to live with if you didn't have the guts to try something. Right. That's like regret the things you, you do versus the, regretting the things that you didn't do. Yeah. Okay. All right, so here you are. You're working for John Van Dyke. He sees tremendous potential in, in what you represent, and that's pretty awesome about John himself. There's an opportunity here to position himself away from doing annual reports, which yeah. he saw like maybe it was tapering out. Yeah. You guys are talking about CD-ROM, and we're talking about the birth of the internet, you guys. Yeah. Now, you and I are old enough that there was a time before internet, and my boy in the back's like, what? Yeah. What? what is that? Yeah. CD-ROM? Yeah. And I had to call my older brother, who's a computer science guy, and believe it or not, uh, yo, uh, what's the internet, dude? Yeah. And he's telling me like peer-to-peer -peer networking, and I'm like, what? What is this? So you're like web 1.0. But here's where it gets really cool. Okay, so we're going to make a CD-ROM. We want video on it. We want animation. We want design. We want all the stuff that multimedia can do. He, he got me a system with Premiere One. You know, uh, I think it was in Photoshop One. I was at Photoshop One at DCI when I was, I did For Rent Magazine. Like that, does anyone know? The, do you guys know like what that, that is, crappy, For Rent Magazine? That was my first design job. And basically, my task was to open up really horrifyingly, horrifyingly bad postscript files and go through all the vectors and everything to make sure that it would print. Because these designers did such bad, just they would just. So this is like production they, art. Yeah, they You're would do through. everything bad that you should never do to a file. And I would have to deconstruct all of that and, and make it. But I became really good at that. Like I, I got, same with, uh, then when I went into, I worked at a print shop for a while. It was hard and fast and you hated everything you did, but you learned a lot about production. For you guys that are like not sure what For Rent magazine is, For Rent magazine is like when you leave the supermarket and there's like stacks of magazines that are free, right? Yeah. They're free. Usually it's like really crappy one color newsprint with a glossy cover saddle stitched. That's what he worked on. Yeah, nothing to put in your portfolio. But, uh, but I learned a lot. I learned a lot about what not to do with vector art and in Photoshop and all that stuff. That was a really great experience. Anyways, production art. And uh, so um, then I worked at a design company, and then I started freelancing for John. Okay, so then 
I, he got me this machine with, uh, with, we had an FWB four gigabyte, you know, drive, and I had a radius, uh, do you remember the radius rocket? Yeah. Dude, that was a 10, this was the only video card that could, that could digitize video, it was $10,000. And all it could digitize was, uh, what I think at its best, it got 720 by 540. It was SD. That, that's the best. Probably thing even it could less do. than that. Yeah. Yeah. Six forty four eighty. Yeah. But but we were awesome. Like we had you know, and we, and I learned editing, and I loved editing, and I learned animation. Loved that. I even uh, I I used this program called Electric Image, which was pre oh, yeah. Infinity D, which I then somehow that technology started going into everything else when before my end, before Cinema Four D. When you say you learned this thing, this is like getting into the heart of the self taught part. How did you, what's your process when electric image comes out? How do you learn electric I would take image? the manual home and, and read it on the bus all the way home. And we had a one hour ride from Seattle to Marysville, which is way north of that. And that's what I did every time I was on the bus. I read computer manuals. Did it turn you on to read these manuals? It did in that I used it to gain an advantage because I did see a lot of people that didn't really care to know the details that could really save you. Like I just taught a class at Otis we had a great session, and I, I, I taught them about hotkeys, for example. Like, if you learn just simple methods of mastery with, you know, your apps that you're using and all that, it cuts your, it's like, it's, I used to race mountain bikes when I was young, and one thing, the main thing I learned in racing is that if you, shave, if you learn to shave any piece off the track throughout the course, you could save yourself six minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, that's what it's all about, is, is being smart about how you cut those corners and every move that you make matters. You know, you could talk about weight and all that other stuff too in racing, but those same rules apply with, you know, what we do on the machine. Like, why do we want to spend all day like doing menus when we could just get all of our hotkeys down? It just makes our process a lot faster. Right. So I, I read it to, to kind of beat the system, sort of. Like, I always wanted to... to not just learn the app, but really work this app. Like this thing is gonna, you know, really benefit me. Tremendous respect for you. That what I'm hearing from you is what motivated you to read that was, I gotta just keep ahead of the next person. Right. And you're grinding on these things and I don't well, share well, but, that. But, but more than that, yeah. it's, it's this economy of time. Like we only have so much time in a day. Sure. Don't we wanna, don't we wanna get all the, the cruddy stuff out of the way first so we could do something fun? that we're really interested in. And, and yes, I did use it to try to gain an advantage because yeah. I had kind of a chip on my shoulder. I wasn't, I didn't have a formal education. So, so I want to talk about formal education a little bit, but I want to, I relate to what you're saying. I totally do, except for I can't read those manuals. I try and I'm like, I'm falling asleep. But I've had that same feeling. Like my wife would like laugh at me. You're, you're such a geek. I, I mean, when Macworld Magazine came in the mail, it was like porno for me. It was like, oh my God, that hard drive, are you kidding me? And now I gotta compare that manufacturer to this and every little thing. I'm like, shh, shh nobody talk to me. I'm, oh my God. But so much was happening though, too. Like we, you know, and that was it. It was like magic. We just had a few, it was magic. Yeah. I mean, without getting into all the horrible details about like what this magazine meant to me, but I get the sense that you're going through the, the book, the manual, which is on the next level. And it was mind numbing. I had to though. Like I well, also because I was the only guy sitting in that chair. Like no one else in the shop is gonna help me figure out how to how to use this thing. So um I learned very early in my career the importance of self sufficiency. And then later in my career I learned the importance of delegation, of course, but you know, it's critical. So you guys that are sitting here and watching this wherever you are, wherever you are, and you say, I'm a self-taught person. And this is where I kind of like, really? Self-taught doesn't mean that just you didn't go to school. It means that you got the education that you needed, but you just didn't do it through traditional or conventional means. The fact that you went through this is just, it's killing me right now. It's like, wow, I, I, I just can't even believe it. And this explains so much about you. Let me explain to you someone else I know that I'm good friends with that does that today, Ash Thorpe. If, if any of you look at his work or follow him, the way his approach, he totally reminds me of how I was when, when I was that age. 
it's the same situation. It's like he, the odds are against you. You know, you, there's no way you're going to gain an advantage unless you do this. You have to do this. But today makes me sad a little bit because we, we have so many channels of information that we're quite cool with. It, back then, okay, um, do you remember Wired Magazine in the 90s? Do you remember the things that were talked about during then that we are now living today? All the futurists, for example, Kevin Kelly and all those guys. And they one, I think it was Kevin Kelly, he said, in the future, it'll, what we're going to be doing is called scanning the dumb current. And what he meant was, is we're going to be, there's this sliver of information that we're just going to be happy with without us really caring about going deep into things. I was appalled, like, for I don't want to get into this, but I was appalled in talking to people about the election that occurred that everyone was upset about, how little information they really knew about the details on both sides. And, but I think we live that way to a large degree today because we just have so much of it. And we, want, we have this idea of wanting more and more and knowing what everyone else knows when it might be better to just grab that one thing that you really want to learn something about and just, like you said, you know, just bury yourself and lock yourself in a room and say, I want to learn all of this. And, and that stuff I'll focus on later, but I don't want to just learn what everyone knows. Like, I want to go way deep in this stuff. You're like a dolphin. He's like deep diving. <laughs> yeah. It's deep diving. Right. That's awesome. Okay, so let's get into your professional life and something that looks a little bit more like the career you're at or on today in terms of being this sought-after main title designer. And I forgot to mention in the opening of the show, and this is an incredible accolade to throw at somebody, Danny's work for his main title for Kiss Kiss Bang Bang was considered or called one of the 50 greatest main title design sequences of all time. Okay, so just keep that in mind, you guys. The polarity, and I just want to continue to frame our conversation with a guy who's self-taught. And I really appreciate you sharing this kind of really bumpy start with your dad leaving you and trying to figure things out and struggling through all this stuff and never giving up. So the heights in which you can go, the things that you can achieve, if you're willing to read a manual from cover to cover and just stay so focused and every, it seems like you are on every new piece of technology. Like every program you talked about, it's like, I might have wanted to learn that, but you know, I'm going to stay here. And I have a very different path to design, so it's very fascinating for me to hear this kind of alternative way to get in. We had it a little easier, didn't we? I mean, we could stand out a little bit easier back then. Um, I see so much talent now, but there is so much talent that it's really hard, much harder to get noticed. But, I mean, maybe some of the things we're talking about matter even more yeah. because it's so hard to get noticed. Well, maybe this is a great opportunity for us to just take a quick Q&A break. You guys want to ask Danny some questions? My name's Derek, and my question is, um, when you got that first computer and you were, you know, reading the cover and stuff, did you see that as a, you know, creative outlet, this will be fun, something to do, or did you immediately look at it and see there is business potential with this? this is how I can make money, and, and that was part of what drove you to learn it? That's a good question. Um, I definitely enjoyed it. Like, it was, and it wasn't the first time I used a computer. Way, uh, when I was 17, my uncle had this, um, we were in Kansas City, like my, my uncle, I went to my uncle's house during this, when I, I would stay there in the summer, and he had this, um, it was like a Commodore or something like that, and he had, he had a program that you could put data into it that numerically made a note. And so there was this song that I liked by this group called Michael Shanker Group that there was this guitar riff. And I did all the notes for the guitar riff on it and hit, you know, send on it. And it did it. And something lit up in me. I'm just like, this is so awesome that you could put this into a machine and this comes out, you know. And you guys have to understand that, that, not, that very few kids were doing stuff like that back then. We were... And, and that's, there's a lot of good stuff about that, too. I won't be the grumpy old man talking about how wonderful it was that we actually were out in the street playing and interacting with each other back then. But um, when the computer revolution started to occur, yeah, something in me just lit up. And I'm, I'm like, I don't care if I suck at this. Like, it just turns me on so much that I could put this into this machine, and it gives me something that's amazing. 
you know, it, but more than that, as you know, it enables me in, in a way that I could have never been any other way, so. Do you credit some of your success, or, or part of it, or most of it, to sort of the, the struggles that you had to overcome, the huge hurdles? I do. Um, there's a great guitar documentary called um, It Might Get Loud, and there's a segment in it. Does any, has anyone seen that? How many guitar players you got here? <laughs> All right, good. Jack, the Jack White, uh, do you remember that? When he was talking about the struggle, uh, like he had this, he plays Gretches, and anyone that plays a Gretch, you might know that the action is very high on a Gretch. It's not a shredder. It shreds you. <laughs> like you, you're hammering down on that thing and getting ripped up. If you're playing it that hard, it'll tear you up. It's not meant to be that kind of a guitar. But it shows this clip of him hammering at this thing so hard that it's tearing up his hand, and he's bleeding and all this stuff, and he's talking about how he likes it that this guitar is a struggle because it sort of refines his perspective and why is it that he's doing what he's doing. And, and he wants to work through all of that as sort of, um, it's sort of this ritual, you know, to, to figure out where the soul of the instrument is. And I would not take any of it back. Your question is something that uh, Aaron and I talk about a lot. That Aaron right there. He's, he's doing what I'm talking about him, but he, he grew up with like two loving parents. They're both teachers, they're white collar. And he's like, I wish I was a little bit more messed up so I can have that determination and that grit. Like, I blame my parents for like making it too easy for me. They coddled me. And to this day, they worry about me all the time. Right, so that's like the exact opposite of I was a 90s parent too, and um, we did a lot of weird things in, in the 90s. Um, there's books on it now, I think Nurture Shock is one of them, I've never read it, but I want to. But we gave kids trophies for sucking at soccer, like that doesn't make any well, this, sense. Well, this happens now. Well, yeah, like why? Like a, tr a trophy is something you earn, it's not, you know. And I, th and, and I personally think that the reward system that's built in our minds through something like video games too can be damaging because it really isn't that hard if you're fast enough to just get the prize. And, and it, it's a, for me anyways, I think it's a good practice for us to learn how to do hard things and work through hard things. So, because the reward is so sweet when you finally figure it out. I almost feel like sometimes you have to be tested in a way, whether you hit some kind of hardship, some kind of setback, uh, your F's failing, and all of a sudden that's your reality check. And when you get there, that's when you figure out who you really are. When, when you hit that point when you have to determine, am I going to crumble or do I get up? Do I get up off the mat or do I just stay down for the count?